start uh, me too yes you can start sir we'll okay like. so good evening uh, everybody there uh, it's hard to welcome to today's uh, a prestigious solution from college of general practitioners along with i am hyderabad city i wholeheartedly welcome our chairman dr ramkrishna satwalekar president of uh, uh, i am dr rajendra yadav president elect dr wilford disuza past president sri lata past president joshi uh, uh, and all the members who have joined now and hopefully much more will come uh, it's a real pleasure to have one of the leading uh, medical oncologists from our state dr santil rajappa who's been known everywhere and uh, we all heartedly thank him that he readily agreed to give this prestigious solution uh, i like to read the, something about doc, life sketch of dr g k kiloskar uh, dr gangadhar kasinath kiloskar was born in 1871 at panada in kolapur maharashtra state in a well to do family he passed intermediate at ferguson college pune and later took his dmns degree standing first in the class dr kiloskar settled down in hyderabad in the year 1900 as a private medical practitioner those were the days when the private practice was looked down by the public starting as a struggling practitioner he gained wide respect to his from his patients he is one of the founder member of hyderabad branch that is the provisional branch of indian medical association in 1939 working single handedly he came to be regarded more as a medical institution than an individual dr kiloskar was a great philanthropist who donated liberally to many public causes and institution he died in the year 1959 at the age of 88 leaving the tradition established by him to carry out by his family members a trust on his name was formed in 1960 by his wife mrs kashibai kiloskar which contributed to the usmania university for awarding gold medals to the best students as everybody is aware that dr gk auditorium in ima is one of the donation from dr kiloskar uh, more about dr kiloskar our uh, uh, chairman dr ramkrishna will uh, satwalkar will highlight and now i request dr ramkrishna to his uh, chairman address ram good evening all the doctors who have joined in seniors juniors it's a great pleasure that my grandfather's oration dr g k kirloskar was my grandfather and as rightly mentioned he was one of the founder members of the indian medical association city branch as well as the college of general practitioners hyderabad which were started earlier than we have I am. A branch in delhi and to the first generation of his family my mother dr shanta bai as all of you know was one of the president past presidents of the city branch and his second daughter who was also a doctor gauri bai kirtane a well known pediatrician in nilofar hospital in those days importantly his daughter in law dr jayshree bai kirloskar is one of the well known gynecologist about 20 years ago and was a very good teacher in gmh in those days her tradition is carried out by her daughter meena ugale in the second generation we have five doctors in the third generation we have eight doctors if i go on counting <laughs> it is an endless procedure we have from laparoscopic surgeons to minimal invasive surgeons to specialists super specialists working across in the usa and in india a family of doctors we strictly follow all the traditions laid down by my grandfather dr gk kirloskar and i am very glad today that a well known person like senthil rajappa is going to talk to us and it none other than evidence based medicine nowadays lot of stress is laid on evidence based earlier the doctor and patient had to have one to one relation which is no longer there unfortunately among the medical profession therefore we have to have evidence based medicine and i am rightly so that in the practice today 
where more legal implications are involved evidence based medicine has to be followed by all of us whether we have stopped practice going to start practice or like dilip bhanushali who are in the middle of their practice era i am thankful to all of you who have joined in today to honor my grandfather dr gk kirloskar thank you thank you ram uh, i also request dr rajinder yadav uh, president of iim hyderabad city to say few rajinder uh, i welcome all of you to today's uh, this thing uh, dr gk kirloskar commemoration uh, on the topic based medicine why and why not uh, to be delivered by dr tanthi j rajappa and also thank college of general practitioners for their association with iim hyderabad city branch thank you sir thank you rajinder uh, a few lines though the, the introduction of dr santip rajappa runs in few pages i'll go through briefly I hope dr santip will excuse me uh, dr santil rajappa did his mbbs in 1990 to 95 from raja muttaya medical college annamala university md internal medicine fellowship from 96 to 99 from madras medical college chennai diploma in national board in 1999 then dm medical oncology fellowship from 1999 to 2001 from kedway memorial institute of oncology rajiv gandhi health university bangalore well illustrious his career he he was a bright student right from his beginning did so many awards and got gold medals uh, later on when he came to hyderabad uh, in the year 2000 1999 uh, in 2002 he was a consultant in medical oncology at the samudra apollo hospital vijayawada later on in 2003 to 2009 associate professor of medical oncology in nizam institute of medical sciences the autonomous health university hospital caters to population of 80 million that time then in from 2010 he became the senior consultant and head of medical oncology at the basavakarma indo american cancer hospital and research institute right now he is the hod there at the medical institute of uh, american indo american cancer hospital as i said his uh, biotech runs in uh, in uh, in pages uh, few of his sidelines his prizes and medals he was a matthew award for the best outgoing student in anatomy in tamil nadu state for the year 9192 92. dr v n rajshekharan award for the best outgoing student in tamil nadu state in physiology for year 9192 91, first rank university in anatomy physiology biochemistry 92 first rank university in pharmacology pathology microbiology forensic medicine first rank university in community medicine ortholaryngoscopy 93 94 second rank in ophthalmology in 93 94 first rank university in medicine in 94 95 second rank in obgy in 94 95 best poster award in ispo for hyderabad 2001 best teacher award tamil nadu of dr mgr university in 2012 best teacher award diplomat in national board andhra pradesh and telangana chapters 2019 clinical excellence in medical oncology award indian medical association telangana state 2019 Vidya Sarumani Mega City Nova Kalyan Vedika Telangana State 2019 Inspiring Oncologist 2020 by Economic Times Well lot of endowment prizes and annual convocation from the Anamala University 1996 he delivered Dr Indira Bai prize for the best student in the pediatrics in 94 so as i said almost all the departments he has covered i am really <laughs> really honored to read this uh, he has almost more than 150 publication to his credit uh, the uh, the list is the list is endless uh, we are really fortunate to have him today uh, i request dr santil to give uh, uh, speech thank you uh, thank you very much sir thank you for that very kind introduction um, i have actually again summarized the life sketch of uh, dr gk kirloskar Uh, i am honored and at the same time humbled to be uh, asked to deliver this oration today uh, which is you know which has been instituted by the family of course on behalf of the journal of the ima hyderabad central and uh, city whatever that the branch is called and uh, the college of general practitioners hyderabad uh, when i was asked to deliver this lecture or oration the first thing i thought about is 
how would have medicine been in the dr pillow's presentation can you uh, yeah, we can hear you yeah yeah, yeah. So okay everybody, everybody should and mute mute their mute their video this thing okay so when i was asked to deliver this speech. oration first uh, i started thinking how medicine and the practice of medicine would have been in dr kirloskar's times what was the evidence like and how did they really practice and i think uh, you know dr satwalekar very clearly said and and i totally agree with him that it was totally on the patient doctor relationship which still i think is there very much though it has been eroded a bit over time and and so many other factors that's not the purview of today's talk so i was just wondering how evidence based medicine was then in dr kirloskar's times and what has changed over this 100 years so i was just looking at his date of year of birth which is 1971 which is exactly 101 years before me go this right so i was just thinking is evidence based medicine important if it's important how important is it why should we be practicing evidence based medicine and even importantly why should we not be looking at it sometimes so this is the sketch of my talk today i have a couple of disclaimers uh, dr dilip vanushali was very kind enough to go through my you know cv but i have to say that i am a doctor not because of my liking for biology but it's because of my dislike for mathematics right so <laughs> that's how it was so if you think when i'm talking about evidence based medicine i want to talk to you about statistics no i am not i will not talk about statistics i am a clinician i am a hardcore clinician i don't understand much of statistics and nothing beyond the zeros in the p value that's as much as what any one of you sitting here listening to this oration would know so i'm not going to talk about anything out of the world let's start with this very common case at least this has become very common in the past year this is a 45 year old lady a single mother she's a diabetic she's a hypertensive she's obese she's diagnosed with mild covid all right her vitals are stable her oxygen saturation is 93% at room air just below what you would say as normal which is 94% her inflammatory markers and d dimer are elevated excuse me sir the chest was done which was showing corats 3 she doesn't have too much of finances she's got two children to support what shall we do you know it's very easy to say admit her start her on remdesivir she needs intensive care and so on and so forth but look at this she's a single mother she's got very limited finances she's got two children to support so i don't think it's just the medical issues that go into making a decision just think of everything that you would consider to make a decision as to what is to be done for this lady and this is the covid 19 therapy so for you remdesivir convalescent plasma chloroquine toclizumab anticoagulants dexamethasone all of you sitting there are better experts at covid than me i don't routinely treat covid but just think for a moment how many of these interventions that i have listed here on this covid vegetable store should i say dr santil can i can i interrupt you one minute yes, uh, the the slides what you are showing is you are not showing the whole screen uh, dr i am showing the whole screen now sir it's whole screen should i No, yeah, go to the whole screen you are, you are and change the. Ah, you're not changing the slide. Slide, yeah. sir. If you could click on enable editing on the top. Ah, uh, just a moment. Okay. Okay. Now, if you could do full screen, please. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Could you just try to move one slide back? Perfect, sir. Perfect. great thank you thank you so much sorry for that yes sir okay so we were talking about this lady who's got all these problems and this is the covid 19 therapy store i want all of you to think for a moment how many of these interventions that are listed here really have the evidence to be used in mild covid moderate or severe covid or whatever that clinical situation might be how many of these interventions have clearly been shown to save lives because ultimately that's what is important 
Remember remdesivir, whether it's plasma, whether it is anticoagulants. In fact, the one that's been clearly shown to save lives in this big list is the cheapest drug of them all, which is dexamethasone. But all of us go about using these drugs when we have a patient with COVID. Now, is that evidence-based medicine? The answer is yes. And I will tell you why very soon that this is also evidence-based medicine. Now, this gentleman is Dr. Bernard Fisher. He is the father of randomized control trials in oncology. And he gave a very famous saying. He said, in God, we believe all others must have evidence, right? In God, we believe. So the only one which goes by faith is God or religion. For everything else, you must have evidence. Agreed. Great. But I think it's equally important to know, how did you get this evidence? And is this evidence good? Because you just don't want to believe everything and anything that is published. So evidence-based medicine is the integration of best research evidence with clinical experience and patient values. Look at these three components that go into making evidence-based medicine. There should be good research evidence, good clinical experience, and at the end of the day, the most important is patient values. What is it not? What is not evidence-based medicine? It is just rattling out numbers from clinical trials. There are some brilliant people who know all these numbers at the tips of their fingers. What is the percentage improvement in mortality? What is the improvement in terms of admissions to intensive care with remdesivir? All these numbers are in their fingertips and they can rattle out. Please remember, that is not evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is the integration of best research evidence with clinical experience and patient values. So that's important. Now, who is this gentleman who coined this term evidence-based medicine or started this issue that's now termed as evidence-based medicine? It's this gentleman on the left who's called David Sackett and his own fellow who's Alvin Feinstein. And this whole process was started at the McMaster University in Toronto in the year 1968. But ultimately it is his fellow who's Dr. Gordon Guyatt who finally termed the word evidence-based medicine or the sentence evidence-based medicine. And that was in the year 1992. And this is the publication that first coined this evidence-based medicine. That's what you're seeing on your screen here. So it is not very old. It's just about 30 years old, this concept of evidence-based medicine itself. Okay, right. Now, the other thing that most medical personnel should know of, especially if you want to follow evidence-based medicine, is something that is referred to as the Cochrane Library. Right. This gentleman on your screen is Professor Archibald Cochrane, who was, you know, who was born in 1909 and passed away in 1988, who tried to put around all these reviews together and get some better evidence than what each of these clinical trials would actually tell us. And that is called a meta-analysis which is typically what a Cochrane collaboration would actually do. So if you want to know the complete body of evidence on anything, you just Google saying Cochrane database, and then it will take you to a list of topics on which they have the full body of evidence, a clear statistical analysis, which will tell you whether that a particular intervention in a particular clinical condition is likely to benefit or not. So that's what the Cochrane collaboration or the Cochrane database is all about. Now, this piece of evidence is actually very, very surprising. How effective are medical interventions? Now, this is not to do with oncology. This is to do with all fields of medication, put, uh, you know, all fields of medicine put together. I'll just read the conclusion here. Most large treatment effects, that means big benefits, actually emerge from very, very small studies. And when more trials are performed, the magnitude of this benefit actually becomes very, very small. Now, if you thought that each of these drugs that we use in medicine gives you a big effect in terms of the magnitude of benefit, you are sadly mistaken. Most of these benefits are actually very, very small benefits and most of our practice is actually driven 
by these very, very small benefits and not huge benefits as all of us think about. And that is exactly why you need to do evidence-based medicine because we want to know what the benefit of every intervention is for our patients. So there are many steps as far as evidence-based medicine is concerned. And this is what is called as the five A's. You ask, you acquire the evidence, and then you appraise the evidence. That means you analyze the evidence. Very important is to apply the evidence to your practice. And even more important is to assess your performance. Because if you are not able to apply the evidence that is available, and that evidence does not work well in your hands, then I would say this whole exercise is a colossal waste of time. So each one of these A's that we have put up here are important in order to synthesize the whole process of evidence-based medicine and to make sure that our patients get the best from us. So it all starts with asking a question, okay? So this is a mnemonic that's called PICO, okay? So whenever you're asking a question, you need to answer these four issues. Now we start with P, which is the patient, I, which is the intervention that you're using in that condition. C, which is the comparison. What are you comparing it with? You're comparing it with what is standard intervention for this condition. And very importantly, you have to measure the outcome. So these are the questions that you're asking. Who is the patient or the clinical condition? What is the new intervention? What it is being compared to? And what is the outcome? So that is very, very important. And that's how you ask a question. Now, once you ask a question to yourself, then you go in and actually start searching for the information. Now, you've got all of these resources that are available in the internet. It's PubMed, UpToDate, Cochrane Library, as I was telling you. But I think what's there in the center of your screen is extremely important. And all of you people who are listening, will certainly accept and identify yourself with this. It says half of what you are taught as medical students will in 10 years have been shown to be wrong. And the beautiful thing is the trouble is none of your teachers know which half, okay? So half of what you're taught will end up being wrong in the next 10 years. The problem is we don't know which half is going to be true and which half will end up being false. So you ultimately need to keep learning and keep up with what's happening. Now, how easy is reading and keeping up with what's happening? This is the amount of medical literature that keeps accumulating. Now, this was 25 years ago. The numbers that you're seeing on the screen are 25 years ago. 25 years ago, there used to be 5,000 new journals or textbooks per day. 2,000 which are there on the med line, you would get publication from 75 trials in a day. Can you believe? And that's why people very clearly said that we are drowning in information, but we have starved for knowledge. Very meaningful and appropriate sentence. We are drowning in information. There's so much of information lying in front of us, but we don't have the knowledge the reason why we don't have the knowledge is because we are not able to synthesize that information, assimilate it, and apply it. So information is in plenty. Knowledge is not as much as we would like it to be. Now, let's assume that the time available to read it less than one hour per week. All of you are busy practitioners. I am also busy. So if you say that you have only an hour per week to read. Remember, this is 1995. That's about 26 years ago. The time needed to keep current on general medicine is in 1995. You have to read 19 articles every day, 365 days per year. Let me pause for a moment. I'll give you three seconds to think about whether this is really feasible. 19 articles per day, 365 days per year, and that was what was required in 1995 to keep abreast with what is happening in medicine. It's just impossible. Imagine the amount of literature that is available today if it was 19 articles per day 25 years ago. 
And then physicians are all sorts, right? So the one on the left says, he wants to get the good grades, but he will not study. The one in between says, I don't always study for exams, but when I do, I still fail. Okay, he doesn't want to read. And then here is the busy practitioner who is already multitasking. Where does he have the time to read? So it's not really easy to keep abreast with what is happening in medical literature. And that is why you need to have some understanding of where this evidence actually comes from. There are many types of studies that you have. You might have observational studies. You have interventional studies, and then you have what is referred to as reviews. And that is why these levels of evidence are stacked one upon the other, wherein the lowest level of evidence is what is referred to as expert opinion. That means I'm saying, right, in my opinion, that's what is called expert opinion, while the one on the top is what is referred to as meta-analysis. So this is the strongest piece of evidence. This is the weakest piece of evidence. So if you're saying my opinion is, and you're talking about I, me, and myself, that is the weakest link as far as the evidence table is concerned, okay? Keep this at the back of your mind. So randomized clinical trials are one of the best ways to get evidence. Now, the first thing that you need to do when you're reading a paper or any medical literature is to be able to apprise it. You know, I put up this primarily because this clearly shows what has happened in the COVID era. You know, all of us talk about chloroquine. All of us talk about remdesivir. We've got enough reasons to say why remdesivir is going to be a great drug. The abstract shows that remdesivir was successful. When you read the introduction, it is still impressive. But when you come to the results, this is what actually happens. Okay, Most of these interventions actually fail. So what you show in the abstract, what you talk about in the introduction, does not stand up for itself when it comes to the results. So one is important to keep in mind to be able to assess all of these things whenever you are looking at evidence. The next is all of us get carried away by the title and the abstract, okay? Now, an abstract is a Zoom meeting with video. You're putting up your best self in front, you're well dressed up and so on and so forth. Remember, if I was listening to this talk and not one who's delivering the lecture, this is how I would have been. If I was at home, I would have been wearing a shorts and a bunion and sitting and listening to you, okay? So a Zoom with video is an abstract, a Zoom meeting with audio only is probably the actual evidence that is sitting within. That is exactly what I am. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a lot of difference that one needs to make out. Remember that whenever one is looking at clinical evidence, you should ask one simple question and get one simple answer from that trial that you're doing. Let us take this example of Dr. BK Zayenga and Dr. Kushwan Singh. BKS Iyengar practiced yoga all his life and died at the age of 96. Kushman Singh drank whiskey all his life and died at the age of 99. Okay. The question we are trying to answer is, is alcohol good or bad? So that's the one simple question that we are asking in this slide. The answer or the moral of the story is, whiskey gives you a three-year edge over yoga because Kushman Singh lived longer than BK Sayanga. Okay, so we look at some small, simple questions. You know, I don't want everybody to carry home the information that I'm giving you here. It is more to tell you an example, not really to tell you that alcohol is the best way to live long. Yes, if you're happy with it, you probably will live long, but that's what it is. The other thing is what were the interventions? Let's take Ramdesivir is the intervention that you're using. What is it that you are using in order to compare this remdesivir with? So that's very important. The next section that all of us will come to when we are apprising evidence is biostatistics. And that's why I like to call it biostatistics. The reason is most of the time when somebody teaches statistics to us, it's more like statistics, not statistics. So that's why I have you know, termed this term biostatistics for statistics. 
you have to be very clear in the way you're interpreting statistics because as Benjamin Disraeli said, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and then there is statistics. So if you don't know what you're actually reading, if you're not able to interpret it, you can actually get easily misled by what the author is actually trying to tell you. Okay. The other thing is when you look at something that's called as a subset analysis, you do a big study trying to answer a simple question. But then at the end of the study, your whole study is negative. <clears throat> You're then going again and looking at small groups and trying to say, did somebody at least benefit this intervention, which is my baby, right? So this is something that we call as data torture. You keep torturing the data, you will get something that is actually positive. And this is typically what happened in the Corona times. Pharma companies made sure that statistics, statisticians who are sitting there squeezed all the data as much as they could so that the company could find some group which benefited from these very expensive pharmacological interventions. This is typically not what we should be doing in clinical practice, or this is typically not the kind of evidence that we should be taking to use it in our clinical practice. So when you're looking at evidence-based medicine, you need to get the information, try to appraise the evidence, try to know a little bit of statistics and so on and so forth. So, so far we heard about why should we be practicing evidence-based medicine? But then there's nothing in life that does not come with problems. And evidence-based medicine also comes with problems. To generate evidence is time consuming. You may not have the time to get all the evidence that is necessary to use something in clinical practice. The classic example is COVID vaccine. You know, all of us became educated about phase three clinical trials because of the COVID vaccine. And all of us know because of the pandemic, it got that emergency approval <clears throat> because we don't want to wait until all these trials will mature. We want to have the minimum safety data or minimal efficacy evidence that is necessary to authorize use of a particular drug that's what we did in case of COVID vaccination. So generating evidence can take years and there are situations where we cannot wait. Clinical trials are very controlled. The best patients actually go into clinical trials. The COVID vaccine trial is a typical example of that. You have to be a fit adult to go into the COVID vaccine trial. But then what happens to cancer patients? What happens to people who are immunocompromised? Can they take the vaccine? I think that is typically not answered in most of the clinical trials of COVID vaccination. So the trials are very, very controlled. We need to have some knowledge of statistics, something that's very minimal. You don't have to know all the numbers, all the ways that these are calculated, but some minimal knowledge to make sure that you're not hoodwinked when you are reading a paper. Remember, all papers are wrought with biases. You know, I like it because it is my intervention. So I want to say the best about this particular intervention. So all of us have biases in the way we interpret data, in the way we present data. And there are conflicts of interest, especially in situations where the trial is sponsored by the industry or the, I mean, <clears throat> the pharmaceutical company. The other important thing is, do we know whether this intervention really works? Do we know whether Randesivir really works? I think in the trial, some endpoints, yes, but predominantly my personal opinion is that it does not give you so much of an addition. And then most importantly, it's, it's, it's important to know the attitude of the patient. What does your patient want? You may have a lot of drugs, but can your patient access it? Can your patient afford it? I think these are very important. You might have a super clinical trial that says that an intervention is very, very useful. But if the patient says, oh, come on, I don't want that. That's bad attitude. If he or she cannot access because it's not available or it might be available, but your patient cannot afford it, then EBM or evidence-based medicine just goes for a six. It cannot be applied in the clinic. The other important thing is that Trial reporting can actually be misleading. And this is from some oncology studies. 
when people frame conclusions, they are very, very clever. Even in very important high level conferences that happen, a third of all the results that are reported, they are reported like as if they're positive, though the trials were actually negative. So one should again not get carried away by reading the abstract and only the conclusion because a significant proportion of these trials were actually negative, but they're reported like as if they're positive. The other thing that all of us go and see whenever we read a paper or a trial is what? Is the p-value less than 0 0.05, right? That's the magic number. That's the statistical test that everybody applies to say that an intervention is significant or not. But please remember, that an intervention might be statistically significant, but it has to be clinically significant for it to be meaningful for our patients. So remember that statistical significance in a trial need not necessarily amount to clinical significance. These may be totally disconnect from each other. <clears throat> now, when evidence is not adequate for a particular clinical situation, what do we do? The experts in the field sit together and they frame clinical guidelines, okay? So clinical guidelines involve all of these studies and also involve experts and their opinions. And that I think is a very, very important part of the hierarchy of evidence. Because again, let's take the classic example of COVID. WHO has guidelines, ICMR has guidelines. Remember that all of these guidelines don't have big clinical trial evidence behind them, a lot of the evidence that's been generated is actually based on expert opinion. Remember, we started by saying expert opinion is the weakest link here, but when it comes to a situation where the evidence or the level of evidence is not adequate, expert opinion does matter in that situation. So I, me, myself, you know, my professor says, so that professor is expert opinion, and that actually matters in a situation where experience counts. And I have to admit that experience does count in our profession. <clears throat> but what happens when there are too many guidelines? ICMR has got a guideline that changes every two weeks. WHO has got a guideline which changes every 48 hours. So this is what happens. You know, you get stressed up with your guidelines. It's the paradox of choice. Less is sometimes more. Let me listen to one guy who is talking about guidelines. Let me not look about the CDC, WHO, and then the ICMR, because you might only end up getting stressed. You might not end up getting benefit out of that. So that's important to keep in mind. And then something that all of us don't think about, but is very, very important to think all of us think as doctors because evidence-based medicine is very, very disease-centered. How do you treat breast cancer? The question should be, how do you treat this patient with breast cancer? That is different from how do you treat breast cancer? And I'm sure people here in the audience whose you know, relatives or, you know, or friends or anybody who's been treated for any disease would identify with me when I say it's important to treat the patient and it is not just important to treat the disease. The disease is important, but looking at the patient as a whole is even more important and that will get you better results in terms of treatment and satisfaction of the patient rather than just the disease. <clears throat> Welcome to India. I like this slide a lot. You know, India is a country where you have these three kinds of people, okay? This is based on socioeconomic strata. You've got about 5% or 10% who are extremely rich. They can go anywhere in the world to get their treatments. They don't need you and me, okay? And there is this 45% which does not know where their next meal is going to come from. You cannot talk about evidence, remdesivir and covaxin to these people they don't know where their next meal is going to come from, okay? So their priorities are very different. I think it's the Indian middle class that wants everything but cannot afford most of these. They don't have access to many of these very expensive interventions. So let us not feel bad. Let us not worry about it because it's important to understand 
that the best treatment for that patient is what the patient can take, not what your guidelines will say. If somebody says, this is what I can do, doctor, this is what I can afford, never mind. Do that for your patient. Make sure that the patient understands what it takes and doesn't to get a particular intervention, the risks and the benefits of that. So remember that the best treatment is not what you can offer. The best treatment is what your patient can actually take. And this, I think, is a very, very meaningful statement. And finally, the cost of therapy. I've just cut this from the internet and put it up on your screen. Look at the cost of therapy for a month for this drug, which is an anti-cancer drug. The cost is $24,752 a month, which is nearly $800 a day. Okay, And you know how much survival is improved because of using this drug? About four months. So remember that our interventions are very, very expensive. They can reach nearly $1,000 a day. And that is why many of our patients end up on this journey. They start with their pockets full and end up with their pockets empty. And this is not unusual to see. This is not specific to oncology. This is not specific to COVID. It is, it is, it is very general and can be applied to many diseases that we treat today. <clears throat> Remember, we started by talking about randomized controlled trials. Okay. Now, when you're extrapolating results from a randomized controlled trial to a patient, it becomes very, very difficult. Now, let's take the case of ramdesivir in COVID. We know that ramdesivir brings down the admission to in intensive care by three days, and that's the reason why it was approved. Now, if there is a patient's attender who is sitting across and you're talking to that patient's attender about ramdesivir, and you say, I'm going to use this drug because this drug brings down the duration of ICU admissions by three days. And if that attender talks about this and asks you, doctor, is my father going to get this benefit or not? You can never say, what will you say? I don't know. We have to do our best and hope that the drug works. You know, I will never, so this holds good for an antihypertensive drug also. If your patient asks, will this drug definitely work? You will say it works in 50% of all patients, but we don't know in which 50 your father is. You know, I'll never forget a patient to whom I was talking. I was talking a lot of science. I was rattling out a lot of data. And then the patient finally asked, doctor, me ko telavadi idi panjeshtunda leda ani simple ge cheppali ante. Yes, in a way, he is actually correct because I don't know whether the drug is going to work for his father or not. So we talk about lots of evidence, but when it comes to the individual patient, it's almost impossible to say whether a drug or an intervention will work. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, evidence-based medicine has many facets. It is just not clinical research evidence. You have to use your clinical expertise. Remember, we started by saying clinical experience is extremely important to trade the risks, benefits, inconvenience, and costs. What does the patient want? How many times have we asked our patient, look, this is what I can offer you. What is it that you want, right? And of course, you have to know from where this evidence was generated, right? Please take your patient into discussion or consideration whenever you're making a decision. Because medicine is as much as an art, as much as it is science. So the art of medicine is something that we learn as we go by. The science of medicine is something that we have to get and read from the books. Art is something that we acquire as we go about treating our patients. And medicine is as much an art as it is science. So instead of showing this Venn diagram at the beginning of my talk, I put it towards the end of my talk. Remember that evidence-based medicine is sitting somewhere here. It's a combination of clinical expertise, research evidence, and patient preferences. It is just not research evidence because all of us think 
evidence-based medicine means what comes out of research. Remember, it's not only research evidence. Research evidence is important, but it's an amalgamation of research evidence, clinical expertise, and patient preferences, ultimately, which goes to making what is evidence-based medicine. And more with a, with, with a little bit of humor, there are seven alternatives to evidence-based medicine, which is eminence-based medicine, vehemence, eloquence, providence, nervousness. And remember that there's something called as confidence-based medicine, which only surgeons can have. So if there is somebody who is in the audience who is a surgeon, pardon me for that. You know, I like this movie, Munna by MBBS, a lot. You know, whether it is Chiranjeevi, whether it is Kamala Hassan, or whether it is Sanjay Dutt, I think there is a lot for us to learn from Munnabai MBBS. All of us have a Munnabai inside us. Okay. I think we need to let loose that Munnabai once in a while, if not all the time when we see our patients, because what patients actually need is a hand around their shoulder to pat them and then say, okay, it's all right. You will get better. I think, you know, Dr. Satwalekar started by saying that this, that the human touch is slowly going away. I think it is the duty of each one of us in this profession to make sure that we don't lose that human touch to medicine. And we all need to let out the Munabai in us once in a while, if not all the time, because that is a major contributor of what you are going to offer your patient and how satisfied your patient is going to be. And finally, if you want me to summarize evidence-based medicine in one line, I think this is the classic line that I want you to take home today. You treat a disease, you win or you lose. <clears throat> you treat a person, I guarantee you, you will win no matter what the outcome is. So let us all be patient-centered and not disease-centered. Ask our patients what he or she wants and make sure that you're treating that person and not just the disease. Thank you so much, all of you, for listening to this talk. I hope that it made you a little wiser and better so that the way you will be approaching your patient tomorrow might be a little different and definitely positive. With that, I will hand over the screen back to the chairpersons. Thank you so much again for that opportunity. It's been an honor to deliver this oration. And I'm very much humbled. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Santil Raja, for this wonderful... Uh, when, I, when I read the uh, title of your oration, I was wondering what you are going to talk. But you made us wiser by giving such an in-depth of what is evidence medicine. Uh, as you summarized lastly, that it's ultimately how you treat your patient, how you... Uh, not the disease, but the patient. A wonderful talk, Dr. Santil. We thank you from the College of General Practitioners and Hyderabad City for uh, sparing your uh, valuable time and giving this wonderful lecture. Thank My you, pleasure, sir. I would like to say the last word. Yes. This is coming back to what I started. Hmm. A doctor to patient one to one relation is always better. You, though we have to go in for evidence based medicine. A one-to-one -one relation between the patient and the doctor still would end as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Dr. Sentil, for a more questions are asked. So we thank you again on behalf of the College of General Practitioners and Indian Medical Association for a beautiful oration. Uh, here, I, let me intervene. Uh, I have to remind all the people who are attending today that we have uh, three more orations lined up. Two is on Saturdays, Dr. B.K. Nayak and Dr. Umud Ben Nayak oration. This is on Saturday and one Dr. Puntambekar oration is on Sunday. So please join us uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and thank you everybody who has attended today's program. Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday, yeah. So the link will be sent shortly. Thank I you. I think most of you have got the link. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Santip. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Right.